All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andrew Golden, and I am Arts Fund's Program Advocacy and Operations Manager. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Broken Engagement, Why Has Our Board Checked Out? How Do We Fix It? with Rena Henderson-Mason of Bold Agenda. Before I hand things over to Rena, I have a few, a few quick things to run through with you. To start, this is the first in a series of three webinars we are hosting with Rena, centered on building stronger boards. The other two webinars focus on optimizing the board chair CEO relationship on May 14th and breaking down barriers to achieving real board diversity and inclusion on June 7th. You can read more about and register for these sessions on our website at artsfund.org slash events. This series is part of Arts Fund's annual convenings programming sponsored by the Boeing Company. Our convening series provides the cultural sector a platform for sharing of resources, best practices, and perspectives to expand our collective capacity to serve our community. We partner with local, regional, and national practitioners and thought leaders like RENA and Bold Agenda to foster discussion and provide tools and training opportunities in direct response to the needs identified by regional arts and cult cultural organizations like all of you. Whether this is your first time joining us or if you're a returning attendee, thank you for being part of our communities. Now for, for a few housekeeping notes, first this webinar is in listen only mode for attendees, meaning you are all on mute. So all questions and any comments should be typed into the question field in your control panel. We will take time for questions around the middle of the presentation and again at the end. As a reminder, this webinar is scheduled to last an hour and 15 minutes, so we're planning to wrap up around 1215. Please be aware that this session is being recorded and we will be sharing a link for those who are unable to attend. I will also share the recording with all of you after we have uploaded it and ready to view next week. Please feel free to share this with any board or staff from your organization. Next, you'll receive a survey and follow up to this webinar, and we ask you to please take a few minutes to fill it out as we value your feedback. We developed this webinar from input we received from past events, surveys, and conversations to best suit the needs of our cultural partners, and your responses will help set the course for future offerings like this. Finally, before we get things started, I'd like to give a brief introduction to Rena. Rena Henderson Mason is a trusted advisor to mission-driven boards and staff leaders, helping them shape their boards for high performance and tell their unique stories. She trains and coaches boards and leaders on high-performance teams, governance, fundraising, recruitment and retention, diversity and inclusion, and succession planning. Her specialty is empowering board and staff leaders to embrace change, push bold ideas, and build great teams. She has coached board chairs and executive directors through a range of organizational challenges, including growth, leadership transitions, strategic alliances, restructuring, turnaround, and crisis. In addition to her work at Bold Agenda, Rena also serves on the Board Development Committee for the Arts Alliance of Illinois and the Chicago chapter of the National Association of Women Business Owners. We are lucky and grateful to have Rena and her expertise for these sessions. And with that, I'll hand it over to her. Rena. Good morning. Um, so thank you for that great introduction. Um, I'm excited to, to be on this webinar with you. Um, you know, I just a little bit uh, more, I, I just want to let you know that um, I got my start in the arts and culture uh, sector. Uh, although right now I work across uh, the nonprofit sector, I started as a volunteer with the Arts and Business Council of Chicago and was a volunteer for seven years with their board development consulting team. So I've spent a lot of time working with small arts boards and understand sort of those struggles uh, and have spent a lot of time with founder-led organizations. Um, so uh, I'm also a board source certified governance trainer and I rely on many of the board source resources to support my work. And at the end of the webinar, there'll be a list of resources that you can use. And I would encourage all of you to become a member of board source because they have fantastic uh, materials and resources. So um, today we're really going to focus on I think the one issue that I believe may be the greatest problem facing mission-driven organizations, which is declining board engagement. Most leaders recognize it and know it, but they're not sure how to tackle it. Um, so we're gonna talk about really what is board engagement, 
when does it break down? Why does it break down? And then how you can fix, fix it. Um, we'll look at situations where boards typically get engaged. And then I'll give you a to-do list at the end um, to help you with your board. Um, so this webinar is really about you being able to diagnose what may be going wrong. I cannot solve all your board problems in a one hour webinar. So, but I think if you are able to diagnose where you are having challenges, uh, whether it's your processes, meetings, or messages that you're using with your board, then you can begin to focus sort of your time and effort on strengthening those areas. And, and if your board's performance is enhanced, then your mission is able to be uh, enhanced. Um, so today, really, I want you to think about that you must figure out what's wrong and what to do about it, or else you'll begin to feel the impacts throughout your organization. And I like to say to people, for every hour you spend on your board, you will get a multiple of that time back in additional resources. In general, most leaders don't spend enough time in building and strengthening their board. Um, I think if you begin to treat your board as an extension of your organization's leadership capacity, then you will begin to, to reap many of the benefits. Um, and also really think about them as major donors because they should be, right? So, um, you know, I had a client who complained about poor attendance at meetings, missed fundraising goals, board meetings that were not focused or goal-oriented. Goal and they had a few board members dominating the discussion. He was frustrated because he knew that he, he could not bring new board, new board members in, nor could they close their increasing deficit with half of the board disengaged, and the other half focused on the wrong thing. That is so typical with board mem boards right now. There are a lot of uninspired board members sitting in unfocused board meetings, and they complain about the malaise on their board. So let's talk about what's going on. So that's what we'll be doing today. Um, I want you to start thinking of your questions as you go on, um, because I will pause in the middle to answer them. So to get us started, tell me a little bit about your primary role. I'm sorry. And um, whether you're a nonprofit CEO, board chair, soon to be board chair, uh, senior staff, board off officer or consultant. Um, and I know that many of you may wear more than one role, but choose the one that has brought you to this webinar. So we'll give you a little time to fill that out. Okay. Looks like the majority are board officer or really sitting on a board. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. I don't always, many times we get staff on these kind of webinars, so that's great. Um, so let's talk about what is an engaged board. So an engaged board shows up. And I mean consistently and when it matters. They participate, and that means in a meaningful and productive way. They connect, and they connect the organization to key stakeholders, resources, and opportunities. And they reflect and they renew. That means on their own and the organization's performance, 
and they adjust it to make it stronger at every stage. And we'll begin to break this down so you understand specifically what this means. So showing up, when board members show, show up, people notice. And I mean, the meetings are sort of a basic and events, but I was working with a client who was being considered by a funder for a grant for board development services. On a conference call with the funder, a board member spoke up to clarify the need for the work. Um, after the ED spoke, the funder indicated that the board's member's explanation convinced her and she commented on how valuable it was. And she later said that most organizations don't have a board member speaking up for them. So if you could ever take a board member, I'm speaking to staff now, on a funder presentation, meeting, um, they don't have to say much. Sometimes their presence says a lot because not many do that. So I want you to think about all the opportunities for board members to show up and make sure you share with them how to show up. And so we want our board members to be actively participating. The first thing is writing a check, a personal contribution. I know that some board members get their their employer to underwrite things or sponsor things or even make the donation for them. But every board member should be writing a personal check to the organization. Funders wanna see this and I think it puts some skin in the game for them. You know, actually speaking up and having a willingness to have difficult conversations is really important. And then, you know, the leadership that happens on being involved with the committee, being a committee chair or a task force chair, when board members become leaders, you're preparing them to, to begin to address your succession plan. Committee work is really the best way for board members to be engaged in the work of the board and a primary source for new board members. So you might wanna have some committees where you allow non-board members to participate. Um, many organizations use that as a pipeline for their boards. Um, and I want you to think about how board members show up or participate by what they say and do and how they reinforce that in the meeting because that helps shape the culture. You need your board members to connect and that's, you know, board members are really the primary source or really best source for new board members. Um, there also should be opening doors for you uh, for donors, uh, other resources. They should be willing to make an ask, a personal ask. Um, it goes a long way when a board member makes an ask. It's not always, not every board member wants to make an ask and sometimes opening a door is probably more valuable than making an ask. You know, great board members attract other resources, whether it's speakers for events, in-kind donations, when you're recruiting staff, consultants. Um, I can think about being involved with an auditor selection where it was board members who came up with a good pool of potential auditors uh, for actually the Arts Alliance Illinois. Um, one of the most powerful things that board members can do for you is advocate for your mission. 
whether it's within the community, among policymakers, elected officials, you know, when they are good advocates, it gives them the skills to be great fundraisers and it keeps them connected to the mission. It is probably one of the most powerful ways for board members to stay engaged. Um, and then you want your board members to be connected to the rest of the board, to develop friendships or at least respect their colleagues and to help make the board meetings and events more enjoyable for everyone. Because who wants to go to a meeting with people you despise or have no connection to? And then when you start to think about reflecting um, and renewing the recruiting process, they were brought in through a ro robust recruiting process so that they are connected to mission and passionate about it. Understand that this is how the recruiting process is where engagement begins. Um, where expectations are set, where they identify how they will add value uh, to your organization. Make sure that the orientation to your organization is robust. Give them a board buddy, assign them a committee. It's a great way for a new board member to understand their role and how they can add value. And then Regularly, I do a lot of board self-assessments. That should be happening um, on a regular basis, if not annually, certainly every two to three years. Uh, but annually, uh, board members should assess their own performance. Have they done what they said that they were going to do in terms of expectation, showing up at meetings, giving? Um, and think about how your board is structured and designed. Your committee structure should not be static. It should change and be re reviewed regularly based on your strategic plan, um, based on the needs of the organization. And sometimes you may need to add task force. If your committee focus looks like staff functions, then your board will begin to descend into operational activities. When you keep it strategic, board members will stay engaged. No one wants to be on a board to do the work of staff. Now, I will say that many times with smaller organizations where there's not a lot of staff, board does have to do some of the tasks that, that staff does, but be clear when you are in meetings and talking about operational issues, what's operational and what's governance, and be able to break out the meeting to focus on governance issues versus operational issues. Retreats actually are an important way to renew the board. Uh, make sure that there's uh, time for team building in a relaxed setting, um, find time for people to get to know each other, as well as dealing with some of the strategic issues. And then the exit interview. It's really important when board members leave, for whatever reason, um, the board chair should meet with them in person to discuss their experience and really what went well, what did not, how to keep them involved with the organization. Your former board members can continue to be great advocates, connectors, and donors. You have to find how best to engage them. So when you think about these areas, um, I want you, we're on to the next poll, think about sort of what your board's primary engagement challenges, showing up, active participation, connecting resources, or reflecting and renewing. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it and respond.
So it looks like connecting resources is the top area, uh, but active participation too. So I want you to think about those areas and we're going to begin to look at them and how to enhance engagement um, in those particular areas. So if your board meeting members are not showing up, begin to think about your meetings, dissect them and evaluate how to make them more effective. Um, I've sat in a bunch of really bad meetings, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for every board to really rethink how they do their meetings. Um, and then our expectations clearly set out about attendance, whether on the phone or in person. Um, and then have you recruited people who have the time, commitment, and passion to show up and do the work? Many times we, we recruit for the title or the prestige without asking them the questions about whether they can really commit to being on the board and what it takes. Uh, the worst thing I think you can do is minimize the time and resources that are necessary to effectively serve on your board. And then, you know, if showing up is, is the problem, then you need to make this and be clear that being on the board should be a priority for the entire board. Build it into a calendar for the year. That's probably the best thing you can do for your board members is lay out most of the meetings that you can reasonably uh, predict in a full year's calendar. Get it into their calendar. Most people can schedule around an existing meeting. When you pop up a meeting in a short period of time, it's hard to get everyone to appear. So, um, and if they're not participating, evaluate how your board chair and committee leaders are involving other members in meetings. Board meetings should be where all board members feel open to participate. Is there something, ask yourself, is there something about your boardroom culture that makes stifle participation? Is it a problem with expectations? And then you really need to go back to your recruiting and orienting. Do board members understand their unique role and how they can contribute? I know that when I sit on a board, my primary role is not to be the best fundraiser. My primary role is really to question a lot of the strategic and potentially governance issues. I sit on a board development committee. I used to be the finance chair because I still have strong finance skills. I used to be a CFO, but uh, I've moved beyond that, so I don't want to do that. But uh, many times some of my questions are financial because that's where I look at it. So when people understand the role that they play, they will step up and step into it and participate. And if your board members aren't connecting organizations, the organization to resources, think about your expectations. Are they laid out about fundraising in the recruiting process? in your annual assessment of board members, how, how they add value? Um, have they been trained on fundraising and their roles and responsibilities? Have they been trained on advocacy? Um, that's important. And when you think about your recruiting process, is, is this discussed in the recruiting process? Um, it is one of these things that I hear over and over that board members are surprised by the way in which they have to fundraise and how much they have to fundraise. There should be no uh, surprises when they come on to a board. So in, if you indicate it, reflect and renew, um, once again, you have to go back to expectations. 
um, in terms of have you laid that out? Uh, accountability, this goes hand in hand with expectation. Board leadership must hold people accountable, must be laid out in, in up front. But ultimately, all of this can be addressed in the recruiting process. Um, and the board should be organized to support an ongoing process of recruiting, reflecting, and renewing. So I want you to really take a hard look at what the board experience feels like in your, in your organization. From the time they are introduced to your organization to the recruiting and onboarding process, to sitting in a meeting and how they feel walking away from a meeting. Try to put on an outsider's lens and objectively pick it apart. Is it exciting because you're launching new initiatives, jumping into partnerships, or generating buzz? Or is it scary because you're teetering on a financial cliff or, or you continue to tolerate bad behavior? Are you blazing new trails because of a new strategy or campaign? Or are you stuck in the mud because the board does not have difficult discussions or has a complacent culture? Is there time to reflect on your impact among stakeholders or in your community or even enjoying recognition? Or is there more bad news because of the board's inability to fundraise or make tough decisions. Ultimately, is each board member a good fit for the organization's mission, strategic plan, and stage of development? Can they remain committed through it all? And I think if you can solve the fit problem, you will solve a lot of the engagement problem. So when you really look hard at your overall board experience, can you honestly say it is a great experience? And if it's not, you should spend some time cleaning it up so that when you recruit a great board member, they have a good reason to become engaged and stay that way for the long term. So, I'd like you, here's another poll. Let's talk about your board's overall operations, um, whether it's highly functional, it's good, but could be stronger. It's neither good nor bad, showing signs of stress or highly dysfunctional. So take a few minutes to think about your overall board's operations. So it looks like good, but needs improvement. Um, there are some that are highly dysfunctional um, and neither good nor bad and showing signs of distress is there. So, um, so think about that, begin to pick it apart. So we'll have some more diagnosis tools. Oopsie, I'm sorry. After questions, are there any questions right now? Questions? We have one, Rena. Um, mm -hmm. Question is, what are some steps I can take to facilitate a process with my board to allow them to define their unique role and empower them to participate? So, I, I think the most powerful thing you can do is um, 
really do a board self-assessment. Um, you can do that. There's, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, there's some free tools online. Uh, board source has some, you have to pay. Um, you can hire a consultant. Like I do that a lot in terms of um, a full board development consulting project. But if you don't have the budget, there, there are free tools online. If you just Google, you know, nonprofit board self-assessment, you'll, you'll find some things They're free. Um, but I think getting your board leadership to agree that this is a tool to at least lay out some of the questions, some of the things that you should be asking about how you function well and not so well. And once the board sees all the things that are wrong um, or, or working well, you should have a discussion around it. And once you have the discussion around it, you should agree on what are the things that we can do in the next year to help address that. Um, so sometimes it's just the board getting some agreement on that there is a problem. That's why I love assessments, and, and this webinar is totally about assessments. Sometimes people know that there's a problem, but they don't know how to diagnose it. And a board self-assessment is really the best way to go about that. Great, and uh, we have uh, three or four more here. The next one is, our biggest issue is high board turnover. How do we keep members on the board? They are leaving before their term is up. So my question is, um, have you asked them why they're leaving? I think that there is a normal attrition, particularly if you have uh, fairly dynamic young leaders who, because of career and family, promotions, relocations, uh, family obligations that they no longer have time. But I think maybe if you start to have these conversations about why people are leaving, you'll find that they may feel that their uh, skills have not been put to use, that uh, maybe the culture on the board is not welcoming or where, where they don't feel valued, or the expectations around the board, being on the board, have not been clearly spelled out. Um, so really you need to ask them why they're leaving and ask them to be honest. And um, if your staff and board, I would encourage the ED and the board chair to sit down with any outgoing board member and really ask them, how, how could this experience been better for you? Because that's the only way you're gonna know. Great, uh, the next question is, will you discuss how to stop or handle faction forming on boards? Fact, oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, some of that, honestly starts in the recruiting process. Um, and some of it also has to be uh, discouraged by the board chair. It's hard for a staff member to, you know, an ED to sort of say, you know, this isn't a good idea. But the board chair needs to really sort of understand what's going on by why people are forming factions. You need to have individual conversations with people to discourage that, whether having private conversations or in a public meeting just saying, you know, we're divided, um, we need to come together. I just recently facilitated a board retreat where there were some clear factions. There were a couple factions on the board, but then there was the board versus staff. And really, we I facilitated like 
to three hours of a full day retreat to talking about how we rebuild trust on the board. And some of it really, a lot of it emanated from the board CEO relationship. Uh, we have the next seminar on that and, and that is such a powerful re uh, relationship and it will dictate a lot of the culture and the good and bad behavior by how they lead and behave and uh, enforce accountability. Um, but we will, some of that also starts in the recruiting process. Um, making sure that people come in not to serve their own agenda, but to serve the mission. If they are there to serve the mission, then factions shouldn't be emerging. There should be healthy debate, but not factions. All right, thank you. Uh, two more questions. Okay. First one is, how do you hold or how do you deal with strong personalities dominating the group? Yeah, a lot of that goes back to a strong board chair. Um, if a, a strong board chair needs to know how to facilitate good conversations and really think about that, uh, to table conversations when, um, uh, you know, it's getting off topic. Uh, strong personalities sometimes, you know, it's important to have them, um, I think, because Many times they go along with people who have good wisdom um, and resources, but um, there should be a way for the board chair to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, and it may mean that the board chair pulls that person aside and says, you know, I appreciate all your comments, but we need to have room for others to share their thoughts too. And sometimes it's a matter of, is that person getting heard, um, you know, in the way that helps them, you know, put up their idea and move on. Um, so a lot of that is, is just good facilitation. One more question and then we'll move on. Yeah, so here's the last one. I feel like our board is highly functional and also stressed. The work is naturally stressful because of the transitions and because we are learning or leaning into hard conversations. But how do you get board members to feel energized even through the difficulties? It won't always be perfect and we need them to stay engaged, especially those willing to do the hard work. Yeah, so, um, it is, so, um, and that's the reality of being on a board is hard work. I, I encourage you to recognize their hard work. I mean, to really verbally, whether it's the ED and or board chair at meetings, um, give some recognition to people who've really put, been putting a lot of thought and time, uh, whether it's collectively or individually, um, sometimes people just need a pat on the back, particularly if they're a volunteer. Um, give some room for team building um, at a meeting, even if it's just 10 minutes, to sort of remind people why they're, they're still involved. I would also encourage, um, you know, I do a whole workshop on meeting management, but in, in your meetings, put at the top of the meeting a mission moment. Talk about why you exist, whether it's you bring in someone who's a participant in your program to talk about it, maybe one of your staff, maybe it's a community member, maybe it's even a funder to just come in for a few minutes and share sort of something powerful about the work that you're doing because they need to remember why they are there. The work that you're doing can be a powerful motivator and help re-energize. Um, there's, there's lots of ways to remember that, you know, personal calls, thank you for all your work. I mean, we don't thank 
board members enough. And, and to me, that's a role of a board chair. Um, just even if it's a quick email, thank you for your contribution at the last uh, board meeting. It really made a difference and, and moving our work forward. Please continue to, to put that same level of energy. So, I mean, all of these tools are the same things that people do in their workplaces to be energized. I mean, they want to be recognized. They want to be rewarded. You know, nonprofits don't have the monetary means to be to be there. But you know, if you're a performing um, art, maybe it's giving them some complimentary tickets for a guest to come and show up for all their great work. So really think about that. How do you recognize and reward them for their work and keep them energized? So let's keep moving. So I want you to think about here when engagement breaks down uh, for your board. And we're gonna talk about it. Is it uh, in the identification process? And identify, cultivate, and, and recruit are all part of the recruiting process. Orient and involve is where really engagement is initiated. I, I do believe that if most board members don't find a way to be actively engaged in the first 90 to 120 days of them being on the board, they check out real quick. You really need to, to make sure that they find a way to get engaged. Um, and then the educate, evaluate, rotate, that's the reflect and renew part that we talk about. That, you know, they need training, ongoing training. Every year, some, some aspect of board development should be. They need to evaluate themselves individually and as a group. And, and you need to bring in new blood, new leadership all the time. And then that last piece in the middle, celebrating. We're gonna talk about this. So when engagement breaks down before their first meeting, here's why. Um, that you know, there's a small candidate pool. There, you're only recruiting from you know, a number of entry points. Think about how to expand that pool of process um, in, in the recruiting process. Um, so sometimes there's a poor fit or there's a lack of clarity about expectations. Maybe your board's too big. That's usually not the problem most people are struggling to find, but sometimes it's too big or poor onboarding or you just, you don't really have a recruiting process or it's recruited uh, or it's poorly executed. So how you enhance it before the first meeting. So ex gener expand your pool of prospects and bring them in many ways. You should be positioning your organization so the best people are drawn to your mission. Some of it has to do with who is on your board already, but you must have a robust process. And you must cultivate prospects as if they might be major donors because your board members really are, should be major donors. So think about that. Um, and then you're trying to build a high performing team, much like any sports team, whether it's the Astros or the Warriors or the Eagles or Villanova, you know, really examine your board composition through a matrix analysis. Slice it and dice it many ways. Do you have the right kinds of people on your board to make it a high performing team? I want you to screen for fit, but be honest about what's expected. And what's the right size? Well, I like to say big enough to get the work done, but small enough to stay engaged. 
And then for nonprofits, most boards with less than seven or eight people, that's really too small to get the work done. But over 30 or 40 people is probably too big for them to feel engaged. I don't like to be prescriptive because every organization is different. Um, most boards now, particularly even <coughs> large arts and culture organizations, are trying to, uh, at least for their governing board, make it a little bit smaller and more manageable in terms of greater engagement and um, sort of the right size. I see, I've seen even the big institutions come down from like a board of 80 people down to like 50. That's still too large, I think, but um, everyone is really looking at this. So, so uh, most important is just make sure you have a recruiting process and it's robust and that you don't skip a step. So when you start thinking about during meetings, um, you know, are your meetings painful? I mean, really, who wants to go to a dull meeting as a volunteer when you've sat through a full day of meetings in a day job? Um, really think about the accountability and the behaviors, the content and the dis design. Uh, personally, I really don't care for meetings because I know the amount of prep it takes to run a good meeting. And most people don't do it. And most board meetings reflect that. Um, board chair and committee leaders sometimes don't know how to get the best out of a dynamic board. And that's really sort of, you know, they don't know how to manage difficult people or discussions or that bad behavior is tolerated and then it descends into you know, a culture that no one wants to be a part of. Um, many times meetings aren't focused on the things that matter most for the organization, where boards can have the greatest influence. So really start to look at that. If your committees are not functioning well, then board meetings begin to focus on the minutia and not the strategic issues that are most important. So how do you address this? It's all about leadership. Uh, you know, share it, model good behavior, discourage bad behavior, and incorporate team building. Really, you know, there's a time to have fun. I sit on the board of the Arts Alliance Illinois uh, lately because we have a late uh, afternoon um, uh, board meeting. We usually have wine at our meeting uh, and an opportunity for people to come a little early to uh, talk and connect, and some people stay afterwards to do the same thing. Um, and really, you might want to even have a separate event where people can connect, whether it's a dinner, whether it's at pre post uh, of your own organization's event. Maybe it's an opportunity where they can bring their family. Um, think about that, how to get people to show up and have fun. Um, and think about the design, you know, using dashboards to collapse, to compress the time in a meeting um, and using consent agendas. Um, if Google that, if you've never heard of that. Uh, so, and, and, and spending time educating in a board meeting versus reporting. Um, the consent agenda sort of reduces the need for the report out, which gets dull and boring. I turn off personally in five minutes, I'm looking at my computer or my phone when I am sitting in a meeting and someone is reporting out. I, I am one of those and I know other people do the same. Um, so, really think about the structure and the design of your meetings. This generative thinking, it's really thinking about higher level issues, not just strategic, 
but making sense of where you should be going, looking far out into the future about meaning for the organization. What does it mean? Um, I spend a whole workshop on that, by the way, so that, that's hard to cover. But you should be talking about your strategic plan and strategic priorities in your board meeting. Um, when you start to start talking about operational issues, that is one way to make the meeting dull and um, not valuable. So <clears throat> why does engagement break down after and between meetings? Um, it's really about no one is is holding board members accountable for getting things done. Um, there's probably one or two leaders who feel that they have to do everything and then things fall through the cracks. Some of the leaders may not understand what it takes to lead a team for high performance. And then your committees, they must meet and do work. Um, or people don't know what they should be doing in the committee. So a, a lot of that comes from the leadership, leadership, the board chair, the executive committee, um, and even the, the executive director. Um, so how do you make engagement happen after and between meetings? So I just want you to realize that the lack of follow-up between meetings makes your next meeting not as effective as it could be. Because this is when the real work gets done. So if you focus on mission and strategy and actions tied to the strategic plan, that will help. Um, leadership needs to be shared and you understand high performing teams and accountability. And then the committee, that's where work gets done. Um, once again, recognizing people, you know, how many of you actually send out an email in between meetings and recognizing something that someone said in a meeting and recognizing about some of the work that's been done in between meetings. That's one way to do that is, is, is recognition, but also to point out work that's being done. So I want you, last poll, um, where does your board's engagement break down? Before the first meeting, during the meetings, after the meetings, or at every stage? Okay, so after the meetings, in between meetings, it looks like that's the where the big, so really think about, and, and this is really the role of the board chair and any committee chairs. They've got to make sure that people are doing what they say they're gonna be doing. And if it's not clear what should be uh, what should be happening in between meetings, then the ED and the board chair need to, to, to have some kind of powwow of what needs to get done before the next board meeting. There's some clear things that every organization needs to plan for and incorporate in their sort of committee meetings and ultimately their board meetings an audit, a budget, uh, potentially some program uh, changes or initiatives, uh, a major event, uh, recruiting, you know, how you bring people on, when, when do you do that? 
you should be recruiting all year long. So in the Arts Alliance Illinois, we recruit, we think we meet all year long, but we only bring board members on one time a year. Um, on occasion, we've brought them on twice a year. If you know we had a hot uh, prospective board member and just wanted to grab them while they're available, we will do that. But we're cultivating all year long. We're having conversations and recruiting. So I want you to think about all of the things that you can do between meetings to really strengthen engagement. So there are certain situations when boards disengage. So when there's a leadership tr transition, either at the board or the staff, whether it's the um, board chair or even a new slate of officers, uh, in the ED um, changing, um, if there's board chair in, and or CEO dysfunction, um, if it's their relationship or one of them is not leading in, a, in, a, in an, uh, an effective way, uh, before and after major fundraising events. So fundraising events really take a lot of energy out of the board. So some board members check out right before because they don't want to be involved. Others check out right after because they've worked so hard on it. But be aware of these situations and, and try to make sure that you're finding ways to re-engage people. Um, you know, when organizations are going through their own transitions, whether it's they're growing really fast or they're trying to mature or they're going through a restructuring, a uh, merger or restructuring, it requires a lot of board energy and some people just begin to check out. Think about also, are you or your leaders resistant to change? That's when a lot of board members see that. And part of the reason why they may have come on is because they wanted to affect change in the organization. Maybe that's why they were recruited. So think about all of the indi indicators that you may be, be showing that you're not willing to change. And then of course, financial crises, that will have people leaving in droves. If every year there are deficits or there's a, a challenge with meeting payroll, uh, there are not enough reserves, uh, you're really living month to month, then that's very discouraging for board members, partic particularly if they are fairly active in raising money for the organization and they don't see everyone else contributing uh, in the same way. There's probably other situations that may be unique to your own um, environment or, you know, think about, you know, where boards have to put a lot of energy and then many times they step back after that and disengage. So your to-do list, we've come to the end, but keep uh, giving questions because we'll have some time at the end to answer questions. Um, you know, this is hard work. So, you know, ask yourself, what have I done this week to engage my board? Uh, you might even want to come up with 20 things that you could possibly do to engage your board. And then each week, maybe, you know, figure out which one you're going to do. Uh, I know you, for those who are EDs, you're, you're probably saying, on top of everything else I have to do? It's like, yes. <laughs> and for those who are board members, I'm just a volunteer. Yes, but this is hard work. So it, it, it requires uh, continuing nurturing and feeding. Um, and then do this diagnosis, evaluate your engagement before doing an after meeting. You may even want to have a discussion in a board meeting about what would make meetings better. What would 
make the meet meetings uh, more effective in between? What kind of work needs to be done in between? And what should we do before anyone even comes onto the board to make engagement higher? This could be a really good board discussion. Um, and then you might want to develop some strategies for specific si situations. So, you know, you're having a fundraising event, everybody's drained after that. You know, think about what you might do to re energize your board about the work that they've done. Some of it is just recognition. You might want to even do that at, at the event. Really recognize the people who've stepped up, continue to recognize them and reward them. And think about what are the activities that will have an impact in three months, one year, three year, and five years from now on engagement. Some of it is just tearing up your recruiting process, really looking at that. Um, you should have a hand, handout of a checklist for an engaged board. Take a look at that. Ask those questions of your board. You may even want to share it with your board and go through those things. I would encourage you to do a board self-assessment, um, whether you do it yourself or you do it through board source or some uh, some consultant, I, I think it's a, a highly valuable process. So here's some resources um, that you can use that they're all focused on strengthening your board. The board building cycle is about recruiting. Running a good meeting is just everything. It really is. And it's really the only place when you think about a high performing team, the board as a high performing team, the meeting is the only place where the board comes together regularly, whether it's a committee meeting or a board meeting. And so if the meeting isn't run well, then your board isn't being run well. It can never be a high performing team. So I want, want you to think about that. So, so take a look at those resources. So this is hard work. It begins with the recruiting process, and but it's also about accountability. But distributing, it shouldn't just be the board chair's responsibility about accountability. Distribute it through the board. Make committee chairs responsible for getting things done, holding their members accountable. And somehow you've got to build this engagement into the culture the values in your activity. It can't just be, oh, we start with a good recruiting process. No, it's, it's everything. Everything you do around the board has to reinforce high engagement. So more questions. Yeah, we have two questions here that are kind of similar, so I'll ask them both at the same time. The first is, how do you find people to recruit? And the other one is, how do we rebuild or find a new board? Everyone left our board. We have three board members and two advisors. So two questions around recruitment. Okay. So um, I think you need to do some introspection on why people left. If you don't understand why people left, then you can't address sort of how best to recruit the right kind of people. If people left because they weren't just, they really weren't recruited, right? That they, you know, there was one set of expectations told to them in the, in the recruiting process. And when then when they showed up, it was a different, you know, environment. You know, it's sort of a bait and switch. Really, you need to be honest. If it's bad meetings, bad culture, you're not getting things done. If you're financially stressed, um, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge to raise, uh, to recruit people when there is a huge fundraising challenge. People don't like to go on boards that are trying to fundraise for deficits. 
So um, first start, you know, if you don't have much of a board, then I think you have to look at who are your current supporters? Who supports you now? Who understands your mission? And reach out to them. They may not be the board member, but they might have suggestions about who might be a good fit. And it's important to come up with a profile of who you're recruiting, um, you know, recruiting for. And I would encourage you not to recruit for positions. And what, what I mean by positions is, you know, many times people say, oh, we need an accountant, a banker, a lawyer, a marketing person. I would encourage you to recruit for competency. Um, I want to recruit someone who knows how to build and lead a high performing team and they can come from any industry. I want someone who knows how to uh, manage a multi-site operation. I want, an, want someone who knows how to build a brand and make it um, very visible uh, in all types of media. And those are leadership competencies. Those aren't position um, recruiting. So really think about it. I think you need to articulate sort of who makes a good board member. You know, and sometimes it's not the most high profile person or the person who can write the biggest check. So if you lose your entire board, there's something wrong there and you need to do some introspective introspection about what's wrong and how to fix it and really begin to recruit to address those issues okay next question right thanks those are the only two questions we have um, right now okay unless anyone has any others um, maybe you can say a few words to wrap things up and then I'll I'll close out yeah so this is this engagement is hard work. Um, you know, I mentioned a lot about the board chair and the ED, and in our next webinar, we will be talking about that relationship and how to optimize it. Because if you can get that relationship working, then you will, like nine times out of ten, you will have a strong board. Thank you Great. for being All right. uh, Thank you. asking really good questions. Thanks. We're going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you for joining us at Arts Fund for our webinar, Broken Engagement. Why is our board checked out? How do we fix it? With Rena Henderson Mason from Bold Agenda. And thanks so much to Rena for her great presentation. As I said at the top, this program is part of our annual convening series sponsored by the Boeing Company. And there are going to be two more coming up in this series. Optimizing the Board Chair CEO Relationship on Monday, May 14th, and Breaking Down Barriers, Achieving Real Board Diversity and Inclusion on Thursday, June 7th. And you can read more about and register for those at artsfund.org slash events. Before you go, I want to remind you that you'll be receiving a survey and follow up to this webinar, and we ask that you please fill it out to help us uh, set the course for future programs like this. We'll also be sharing a recording of this next week, and you can please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or comments at andrew at artsfund.org. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.